So, you remember how about a year ago I reviewed a troll in Central Park and called it the worst Don Bluth movie? Well, after watching this one, I might have been wrong about that. What? I know that sort of thing is subjective, and I know there are people out there who will disagree with me, and that's fine. But good lord, I had no idea how bad this one was going to be until I saw it. What? Rockadoodle is bad, you guys. And I mean bad. I'm not even kidding. I know people say it's bad, but I don't think they understand that statement when they say it. I thought it was just your typical ordinary bad, but I tell you what, guys, it's worse. So much worse. I had never seen Rockadoodle before this, and all I had to go off of was hearsay, but this is probably the best example of watch the movie yourself to form your own opinion that I can think of. Because again, from what people were telling me, I wasn't expecting this movie to be as bad as Troll in Central Park, if not worse. But boy was I wrong. Not only may this be the worst Don Blue film of them all, it just might be one of the worst movies I've ever seen. Yep. Fucking Rockadoodle really might be up there as one of the worst movies I've ever reviewed. It's worse than any of the Norm of the North movies, All Dogs Go to Heaven 2, Mulan 2, or even Hunchback of Notre Dame 2. It's that bad. And you want to know the funny thing about this? For once, I do not blame Don Bluth one bit for this movie being the piece of shit that it is. You see, at the time of this movie's production, Don was working at Goldcrest, who also produced All Dogs Go to Heaven 1. After his previous movie didn't perform as well as expected, Goldcrest began to doubt Rockadoodle, which apparently was a film that Don wanted to make for quite some time. Rockadoodle is based off of a French play simply known as Chanticleer. It focuses on the titular character who only believes that he raises the sun with his voice. But when a new bird shows up to the farm to take his place, he believes he has to stand up for the role that he believes is rightfully his. The play focuses heavily on the themes of idealism versus cynicism, where Chanticleer is this noble rooster who truly believes he's needed on the farm versus the blackbird who is all about style rather than authenticity. For a play written in 1905, that does sound pretty progressive, but let's just say the words based on definitely applies because this movie is nothing like the original play. Edmund was not a thing. The Duke of Owls wasn't a thing. The Elvis Presley stuff definitely wasn't a thing. Goldie was a thing actually, but I don't think she was that sexualized. Uh, okay, okay, she's got a little something, okay, I'm not gonna lie, I'm not gonna lie! But I think it's safe to say this movie took a couple of liberties. Turns out, unsurprisingly, Disney actually did have plans to make this movie back in the 40s, up to the late 60s. At first, World War II forced the film onto the shelf, but in the 60s, the movie was talked about for a bit. At the time, Disney Studios was having some financial issues, what with creating theme parks and all that, so Walt Disney himself was forced to make a choice between two films, Chanticleer or The Sword in the Stone. You can probably guess which one he went with. Apparently, not only is it cheaper and easier to animate human characters as opposed to animals, but also a lot of people at Disney simply believe the story of a rooster protecting his farm wasn't sympathetic enough. Which, if you ask me, is pretty silly. If we can have a movie about a panda learning kung fu and it be very sympathetic, surely this could have worked too. Eh, but what are you gonna do? There's actually some really great artwork out there by the legendary Mark Davis, which proves the production existed. The designs are pretty darn good. They give a good sense of the character's personalities and pop out very distinctively. Of course, they did get rid of Goldie's ass, though. What the fuck, Mark? Give the people what they want! So, of course, with this being a rejected Disney idea, why shouldn't Don try his hand at it? Disney certainly wasn't going to. So, under Goldcrest Films, Rockadoodle was released in April of 1992, and it was a bomb! It bombed. It bombed horribly. Out of an $18 million budget, the film made only just under $12 million. The loss would hit Don hard and make it even harder to make more movies in the future. Goldcrest was already watching very closely on the budget, and with this massive failure, they officially pulled all funding for future films. Even worse, Goldcrest tried to liquidate Sullivan Blue Studios, claiming it failed to pay back a $300,000 loan. This would eventually be settled out of court, but long story short, it was a big hit. I'm honestly surprised more people don't refer to this movie as what it should be called. The movie that almost killed Don Bluth. Metaphorically speaking. I mean, from what I know, health-wise, I'm sure he was fine, but, you know, you get it. His career almost died. There. That's not as enticing of a title, but at least it's accurate. Anyway, let's talk about this movie now. This movie makes no sense. This movie makes zero goddamn sense. It is one of the most inconsistent, 
batshit insane and incomprehensible movies I've ever had the displeasure of watching. Even with all of its last minute additions that executives added in, which ended up delaying this movie by a whole four months, it's still just an absolute acid trip that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. I mean, with movies like A Troll in Central Park, as bad as they are, you can, at the very least, understand them. It's an easy movie to figure out. In a bad troll society, a good troll named Stanley wants to grow flowers. The queen of the trolls doesn't like that, so she banishes him to Central Park in New York. Soon after, Stanley befriends two kids and shows them the wonders of dreams. The queen sees that he's still happy, so she tries to kill him, she fails, and then Stanley goes on to take over the world all a little shop of horror style. Terrible movie, yet very easy to follow, right? As for this movie? Well, <laughs> let me just try to sum this movie up for you, okay? <clears throat> the movie begins in space despite being about a cock. The cock's name is Chanticleer. Don't know who the fuck named their main character that, but it's based off a French play, so- EAT THE RICH! <laughs> So Chanticleer has the ability to crow, which causes the sun to rise every morning. But one day, this random asshole just shows up to fight Chanticleer for whatever reason. Don't know who he is, what he wants, or why he wants to fight Chanticleer. Nigga, I just like to fight! But he's defeated, and then never talked about again. So, great way to start the plot. During the fight, however, Chanticleer forgot to crow, and the sun came up anyway. Soon after, everyone makes fun of him for being a phony, and Chanticleer is forced to leave the farm. But then the sun just goes back down! Yeah, for... No reason! It just goes back down almost immediately and is never explained why it went down. Don't worry, we'll come back to this. So, turns out that random asshole was actually sent by this guy simply known as the Duke of Owls. Why did this other chicken decide to work with the Duke of Owls? Like I said, we never hear from that guy ever again. Nigga, I just like to fight! Yeah, you could have just had Chanticleer sleep in by accident and it honestly would have made more sense! But then this random human hand shows up, and it turns out this movie is a live-action animation hybrid. Yeah. Makes sense? We're not even seven minutes in yet. So apparently Don Bluth and his team were blown away by Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which was brand new at the time. And so they wanted to make a live-action animation hybrid of their own. These kinds of films actually became pretty popular at this time with films like The Page Master and James and the Giant Peach. Who Framed Roger Rabbit was a huge game changer that would influence animation forever. Even Disney would be surprised at how good it did. So, of course, it made sense for Don to want to try it himself. He was the animation director on Peach Dragon, so this isn't even his first time on a live-action animation hybrid. The live-action sequences were originally going to be directed by a man named Victor French, but after he developed terminal lung cancer, he was forced to leave the film, forcing Don to direct the live-action sequences himself. He would later admit that he hated the experience and decided he would never be involved in live-action again. Uh, I thought, well, this will be interesting. I wonder if I'll like this. Maybe I'll just leave animation and just go into the live-action world and forget all about this graphics. Well, my first day on the stage, I, I came running back here, and I said, no way. <laughs> I'm an animator through and through, and I love being on the board, and I love drawing where I can have complete control of what I do. Uh, it's just too much, I think, waiting around. Uh, the, the control isn't there, and if I don't like a performance, I have to say, well, let's do it again, and 50 people have to concentrate one more time. If I don't like a performance on the board here, all I simply do is get out my eraser and erase it and draw it one more time. So the difference for me is very, very large. I prefer to draw it. So that was a fucking lie. Originally, these live action sequences were supposed to be in black and white, a homage to The Wizard of Oz. But due to Don's lack of experience with live action, a lot of it didn't even make the final cut to begin with. Which really begs the question, why is this a live action animation hybrid? In total, the live action sequences only add up to about five or six minutes of footage. With Who Framed Roger Rabbit or even other movies like James and the Giant Peach, the combination between live action and animation was highly felt. If you remove that element from those movies, the movies just wouldn't be the same. But Rockadoodle's live action sequences just feel so tagged on. With some slight retooling, you could have removed them entirely and no one would have noticed. Which really begs another question, why is Edmund the main character? Seriously, why is this annoying, whiny brat of a child our main character? They really did their best to find the worst sounding child I've ever heard. I've never hit a kid before. Oh no. Shot to Cliff! Shot to Cliff! This is Edmund. It's over for you. Shot to Cliff! Shot to Cliff! Shot to Cliff! Shut the fuck hey, up! Hey, 
Oh, and his acting isn't all that good either. I know he was just a kid, and I do feel bad for shitting on him. Actually, no, I don't. I love shitting on kids. It's so weird since Don has worked with children before. A lot, in fact. But this kid's acting is just absolutely terrible in both live action and voice acting. His voice is just so grating and irritating to listen to with the high-pitched whining and screaming all the time. Just good lord. Jesus, I'm a bully. Huh. But I think the worst thing about this kid is that he's probably the most useless main character I've ever seen. It's actually really strange how little our main character actually affects the plot at all. Outside of telling the other characters where Chanticleer is in the city, which they already knew by the way, it's quite astonishing how little he affects anything. And to anyone who's seen this movie, anyone who grew up with it, answer me this one question. What exactly is Edmund's arc? What does he learn from his adventure? How does he grow fundamentally as a person? Is it to overcome his fear and stop being a fraidy cat? No, because in the beginning, he wanted to go out into the storm to help his family. He was actually pretty brave for a kid, so what's this Freddy Cat nonsense? There's literally only two scenes where Edmund is called a Freddy Cat. Sorry, but that's not exactly a well-rounded arc. I don't know what the hell Edmund was supposed to learn from any of this. Not only does he not affect the story at all with his presence, but he doesn't even learn anything. What is the audience supposed to learn from this movie? What's the message? In the original play, it was about the value of sticking to your oath. That integrity does make the man. But in Rockadoodle, I honestly don't see anyone taking anything away from this movie other than a migraine from trying to understand it. Seriously, this is probably the most confusing movie in all of Don Bluth's library. And even Goldcrest themselves realize this. As I said earlier, this movie went through a lot of post-production that would actually delay the film by about four months. One of these decisions to try and help the movie was to have a narrator try to explain the story as it goes along. Okay, that's not a terrible idea out the gate. It is one of the characters explaining things. He explains the setup of the story, he explains where we are, who the characters are, what they're doing, who they are. Again, where we are. Again, he, he, he's still talking. He keeps talking. He's still talking. He keeps talking. God, he never shuts up! This is the worst narrator I've ever experienced with a movie. I'm dead serious. This guy never shuts up. The whole point of the narrator was to try and make the film seem less confusing. But not only is it still confusing, but now it talks down to its audience like they're blind, deaf, and dumb. Santa Claire was a star, all right. But it's hard to be happy without friends, even if you are famous. He literally explains everything, even when it's clear as fucking day what's going on on the screen. This is where I come in. Oh, that's when you came in? Oh, gee, I had no idea. That's insane. Hey, look, here's me tying my shoes. Hi, Patu. What you doing? I'm trying to tie these doggone shoes. Yeah, you literally just said that, you dumb fucking mutt. But not everybody liked the king. Goldie here was jealous of him. Fortunately for us, Goldie was a lot smarter than she sounded and a lot nicer, too. She just didn't know it yet. Gee, <laughs> fucking spoilers much? They literally just spoiled the movie. For goodness sake, this guy literally narrates over the fucking songs. Yes. Well, my daddy taught me how to sing, and that's why this sports means everything. Sun, we all had our jobs on the farm, and Chanticleer's was to wake up the sun. When have you ever seen a movie that actually narrates over its own musical numbers? That is so crazy! What's even the point of the musical numbers if all you're gonna do is talk over them? Did Goldcrest just really not like these songs? I mean, they're not great, but some of them have decent hooks and at the very least do their jobs as a musical number. But there are songs that actually don't have narration over them, but... Yeah, these songs are ass. The Duke of Owls has a song that I frankly can't even comprehend the rhythm of it. He's not even singing himself, he's just talking while playing an organ behind him. It's just all over the place, but I guess it's made up for with being only like a minute long. But even then, it just serves as a recap of what just happened earlier in the movie, so there's no real point to it either. There's literally these battle toads in the movie that sing for like 30 seconds. I hardly even consider it a song. The song is made even more awkward with this weird ass DON'T TOUCH THE STAR thrown in there once or twice. All the other songs though, if you want to listen to them properly, you actually have to look it up on YouTube, which is just not how you should listen to a musical number in a movie. The sad thing is, some of these songs are actually kind of decent. Too bad I can't fucking hear them over this goddamn mutt narrating over everything! As confusing as this movie is, I would have preferred it to not have the narration, because at least I'd get to hear the songs, 
At least the visuals would at least attempt to convey what's going on. Again, Don Bluth knows visual storytelling, but again, I don't blame Don one bit for this. This was clearly a terrible fucking executive decision. Kind of like adding voiceover over dinosaurs that don't even fucking talk. Seriously, fuck Walking with Dinosaurs 2013. But what makes it worse is just how sloppy the editing is sometimes. There are clear instances where the narration was not there originally. Like in this one scene where Edmund gets turned into a cat. Like, look, he was clearly saying something there, but they just dubbed it over, thinking no one would notice. Well, this 27-year-old grown-ass man who watches a lot of kids' cartoons noticed. And no, there's nothing wrong with that. Goldie was only supposed to pretend to fall in love with Chanticleer. But she was falling in love for real. Oh, really? Well, then why did she give this expression like she hated it? She's just supposed to be pretending, right? Then why are you telling us she's actually falling in love when she's animated like she's faking it? Seriously, I had a point in bringing up Walking with Dinosaurs 2013 because just like that, the last minute executive decision to add this dialogue only succeeded in making the movie worse. And now for something completely different. How does this world work exactly? The movie starts off with Edmund reading a storybook, okay, but then suddenly the book comes to life with no prompting. Oh, but it's okay because by the end of the movie, it was just a dream all along. Fuck you, you're really just gonna settle with the most cheap, lazy, cliched resolution that you can imagine? Well, it doesn't matter anyway because it turns out the book actually is real! The characters, the farm, all of it was actually real. Don't ask how that works because the movie just gives up during the epilogue. Yeah, just screw it, have the movie just fade to credits like it doesn't even mean anything. <laughs> what a fucking joke. Not to mention this movie is convoluted as fuck. Again, bringing up that random asshole in the beginning, who was he? What did he want? Why was he working for the Duke of Owls? He's not even a fucking owl! All of his other minions are owls, even the one voiced by the Dirty Bubble! What are you even doing, you traitor? Oh, but then we have this greedy fox manager who is also working with the Duke of Owls because why would he? It's implied that the owls don't like the city because of the light, so how would this relationship even start? Oh, not the city, sir. Oh, no, it's too bright. I'll go blind. Oh, say it isn't so. Oh, he wears sunglasses. Okay, I guess that explains that. Wait a fuck! These owls hate light. It's the one thing that can stop them. That's why they hated Chanticleer. Because his crow brought up the sun, right? But then it's revealed they can wear sunglasses and be fine? Why don't they just wear sunglasses all the time then? If that's all they need to get around the light problem. We see the little one wear them, so clearly they work, right? So what's even the problem? What, is there just not enough sunglasses for the other owls, is that it? You can't get them in the city, which you're perfectly okay with going to? This is so stupid. Oh, but speaking of the light problem, where the fuck did the sun go? Why did it go back down in the first place? The movie says it's just raining a lot and there's clouds covering it, but we literally see the sun go back down after coming up. But then at the end of the movie, when Chanticleer crows, it actually comes back up again. This is the whole reason the movie is happening. The main characters are going into the city to find Chanticleer so we can bring the sun back. And yet we never learn why the fuck it went down in the first place. The sun literally just goes down for no reason. Was it because of the Duke of Owl's weird magic breath? Yeah, that's a thing by the way, and no, that wasn't it. As far as explanations go, as far as we know, the sun is just a dick. Straight up. Thought it would fuck over Chanticleer's life for no reason whatsoever. Just like your mom did. <laughs> it's either your mom jokes or cock jokes, guys. And let me tell you something, guys. The cock jokes are way too easy, and it's funnier to just piss you guys off sometimes. Some comments are worth it. Oh, and speaking of dicks, and your mom, all these characters suck. I already talked about how much Edmund sucks. In fact, watching him get strangled near the end is easily the best scene in the entire movie. <laughs> Duke! Leave him alone. It's me you want, not him. Chanticleer is such a bland character. For someone who takes up a huge chunk of the poster, you'd figure he would actually be one of the main characters, when in reality, he's only in like 40% of the movie. Hey, here's some force tension. Have him just randomly be unable to crow in the film's climax for no reason. Then have him just suddenly be able to do it again. Just like that. 
Oh, but be sure to have all those things said to him keep echoing in the background to make it all dramatic, even though half of those things were said literally two minutes ago. But I guess we need some excuse for the Duke of Owl as I transform into a giant tornado to make this final battle be all epic and shit. Patu is just whatever. I already talked about how him being the narrator actively makes the film worse, but as a character goes, he's just super bland too. He's essentially just a Phil Harris character. You know the ones, especially since all Patu has going for him is bunions and tying shoes. Wow, what a character! It actually hurts that this was the last character he ever voiced. I know that's not the movie's fault in itself, but still, that's just really sad. Peepers and Snipes are just really unlikable. Peepers is super stuck up and Snipes is just an asshole. There's literally a scene where Snipes almost causes everyone to drown. Oh, but he's claustrophobic! Yeah, that's an interesting character trait that never gets brought up again ever. Almost like it was just some weird plot contrivance to add some unnecessary tension. I guess the casting for Snipes though is pretty good considering he's the same guy who would later voice Mandark from Dexter's Lab. Not because of the character though, no, no. It's actually because the voice actor is actually a huge piece of shit himself. The Fox is just your typical greedy piece of shit. The Duke of Owls is an okay antagonist, I guess. His song still sucks major ass though and his powers are just weird. I mean, seriously, magic breath? Why? Goldie is... Oh, come on guys, you know what she was meant to be. Even the animation isn't as impressive this time around. Lip sync is off at times. Some of these character designs are a bit iffy. By no means bad animation, but just lacking in comparison to Don's previous works. Overall, Rockadoodle is just a disaster, and not even one you'll want to see just to see how bad it gets. It's just pretty miserable throughout. None of the characters are likable. The narration basically ruins any redeemability the songs could have had for them. The story is all over the place. Nothing makes sense. Nothing's explained. It's just abysmal. Absolutely abysmal. Why wasn't this movie about Chanticleer to begin with? Why make up this random, annoying-ass kid to be the main character when you have a story that already exists? Why not instead have the movie begin with Chanticleer being this show-off, full-of-himself douchebag? All the love and admiration he receives has gone to his head, and now he thinks he's the shit. He tells all the farm animals that his singing is what brings the sun up, and everybody loving and admiring him actually believes him. But the Blackbird from the original story would show up and see right through his bullshit, and so challenges him to a fight right before sunrise, so that even if he loses the fight, he still wins anyway, because the sun would have come up and everyone will realize Chanticleer lied to them. This would be in the first 20 minutes of the film. The rest of the film would focus on Chanticleer going to the city, finding a new job, actually working for a living, and, like in the original play, would learn the value of integrity and self-worth. Sounds infinitely better than this shit, doesn't it? I want to emphasize again, I do not blame Don one bit for this film. He tried his best with what he had to work with, but those damn executives just wouldn't let up. They wanted so badly for this movie to make so much as a penny back, and it failed. And you want to know what the worst part of it is? They did make their money back. Just like All Does Go to Heaven, Rockadoodle actually received a second chance on VHS, selling over 2 million copies and grossing over $28 million. Combine that with the box office total, and you've got a good 40 million right there. But by then, it was too late. Goldcrest was pissed, and Don and his team were thrown out to the wind side. <sighs> what an absolute joke. You know, in my All Does Go to Heaven 2 review, one of the storyboard artists who actually worked on the film watched the review and commented on it. I should emphasize real quick that I do know a lot of talent and hard work went into this movie, and I'm not looking past that. I'm not. I'm well aware there were brilliantly talented people who worked on it. This sequence right here, good lord, that's freaking amazing. It's so smooth and good looking. Oh, I can't wait to see that part, Double D. Yes, well, let's not and say we did, Ed. You also got the late Christopher Plummer who voiced the Duke of Owls. He tried his best with what he had, and Phil Harris was still Phil Harris, I gotta respect the legends. I'm not shitting on these movies to make people feel bad for working on it or simply liking the movie, I'm just giving my two cents about them. And I, in good conscience, can't say this was a good movie. In fact, I dare say this might actually overtake a Troll in Center Park as the worst Don Bluth film. And I do mean might. I don't exactly know. Maybe it's a tie, maybe Troll is still a little worse. I'd have to rewatch it to really figure it out. Spoilers for a future video. And speaking of future videos... <sighs> what do y'all think about that penguin one again? You've been talking about patience Hoping for everlasting You're known for talking crazy 
I know it's infatuation You know I feel inside You know what is real and I